And welcome back, everyone, to In the Spotlight. Today's uh, feature uh, story is Robert McCabe's uh, journey through photography in Greece in the 1950s. And we're very happy to have Robert on air with us uh, straight from Athens, Plaka area. Robert, welcome to In the Spotlight and welcome back to uh, New Greek Television to tell us all about your latest book. Well, the... Uh, the <clears throat> Most recent book was a book about uh, Santorini in the years before tourism and actually the two years before the great earthquake that destroyed 85% of the structures on the island. Yeah. And the book was uh, written in conjunction with Margarita uh, Punara, the leading Greek journalist who's at uh, Kathy Medini. And uh, we uh, were able to reconstruct a lot of uh, information from the 1950s with the help of a friend in Santorini by the name of Lefteris Orzos, who uh, has a passion for archives. He's actually an archeologist, so it kind of fits with the, with the, the business of archeology, span but he's making a major archive of Santorini materials. So if uh, any of your viewers are from Santorini or have information, Lefteri would love to hear from you. But he was able to uh, recreate a lot of the situations that I photographed, including the names of people at a baptism on a, in a village called Emborio in 1954. Uh, he, the names of these children who are of course, more than grown up today. So that's the, the most recent book. Robert, I want to just uh, tell our audience a little bit about you. Uh, for those who are not, um, uh, uh, you don't know Robert's wonderful work. Robert McCabe has been capturing uh, Greece uh, through his photographic lens since the 1950s. It's been over six decades of photography. He uh, has had the wonderful opportunity to visit beautiful places of Greece during these this era of which he's captured. He's the only photographer to have captured these images and they're world renowned. Um, and through your books and uh, through your exhibits, people are able to see the enchanted uh, Greece, uh, it, you know, kind of stuck in time. Uh, that was a wonderful era. It was, a, it was traditional Greece. Uh, tell us, and then that one week of vacation that you went with your brother ended up being a lifetime of living in Greece. Tell us a little bit about your journey, where your uh, 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 beautiful images began, and, and uh, a little bit more about uh, some of your favorite places. Well, Lee, uh, in 1954, I really was tagging along with my uh, brother. I had barely heard of Greece, but he had a a Greek uh, friend from college by the name of Peter Nomikos. And uh, Peter invited him to uh, come to Greece for a few weeks in the summer. So we, uh, he got a job, my brother got a job on a student ship as the editor of the student, uh, the newspaper on the ship. And he got me a fare that was uh, so low that it was clearly more interesting to travel to Europe than to stay in the States and a lot uh, cheaper. Uh, so we uh, arrived in Greece with the idea of spending two weeks there and then continuing on to Egypt, Italy, France. Very soon after we got to Greece, we canceled the entire remainder of the trip. And not only did we cancel the remainder of the European trip, but we also even canceled our trip back to the United States. And, stayed uh, much uh, longer than we had intended. Uh, so it was for both my brother and myself, uh, love at first sight with uh, Greece and beautiful countryside and the islands, the interesting islands. I, um, I keep uh, thinking of the, those islands and how they were then and how individualized they were and how they each had their own distinct characteristics. Today, uh, they're homogenized. At that time, they ha didn't have running water. They didn't have sewerage in the villages. They didn't have telephones. They didn't have TV. They didn't have electricity. El electricity. 
And uh, basically there were no cars on an island. I mean, I wonder how many of your viewers have witnessed uh, the way cars used to be unloaded before there were these roll-on, roll-off ferries in Greece. It was a matter of lifting off the deck of a steamer, a car with a crane and trying to deposit it on uh, the concrete of a dock. And it was always a great uh, adventure uh, to watch these cars. So there were very, very few cars. You know, many islands just had one car or many had no cars at all. And there's still islands like that. Uh, last uh, time I was uh, in Nisiros, uh, I think there were maybe two taxis. Well, I mean, you captured an era that was a uh, post uh, World War II. Um, and Greece was, you know, impoverished at the time. It, it, and uh, they're very telling your uh, pictures. You've compiled them in a book, uh, Greece, the Enchanted um, uh, Era, if I'm not mistaken. And it is, it, it's really a beautiful book. It's everyone who loves Greece should have it on their coffee table and in their bookcase. Um, wanted to tell you, what do you believe it is that draws you know, foreigners to Greece. Uh, what is it that drew you? What do you believe it is that, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of resonates with everyone who lands on Greece and loves Greece? Uh, what, it, what are these elements that keep you coming back for more? Well, today, of course, there, uh, I, I say today in the pre-COVID era, uh, there are a lot of people who come to Greece for the sunshine and the summer uh, parties and uh, the beer and the islands. Uh, but the uh, core of people who come here and keep coming back and, and love Greece, uh, they're attracted, I think, by the hospitality of the people, the beauty of the uh, villages and islands and the topography, uh, which in, uh, in has enormous variety. The mountains and the sea in combination uh, present uh, vistas that are, are really unique and beautiful. Walking, there was a, uh, used to be a path on Patmos that unfortunately is uh, being converted to roadway now, much of it illegally but it, I used to call it the most beautiful walk in the world. It was a 40 minute walk uh, from a place called Vaya to a place called Livadi, uh, Livadi to Yeranu. And the path had probably been there for 2000 years going to this uh, fertile part of the island. And it was used by horses and uh, donkeys and the local people. Uh, but with the advent of uh, tourism, the pressures uh, for automobile roads became intense. And instead of going around the paths above them or below them, uh, in this particular case, they chose just to bulldoze the path out of existence. And uh, there are many people now who are fighting for a return of these paths because they represent an enormous asset for off-season travel to the islands. My gosh, Tinos has this extraordinary network of old paths, which they've kept pretty well intact. And it's a great attraction to go and be able to hike around and see the, the beauty of these islands up front. You can't really see it zipping by. And unfortunately, in the case of Patmos, uh, they uh, made a highway with uh, <clears throat> a steel fence on one side and a deep culvert on the other. Uh, so you can't really walk. There's no place to walk. Uh, and it's unappealing to walk on a busy highway. So we're hoping uh, that uh, Patmos, for one, will restore some of these old paths. They still have uh, three or four uh, pretty much intact 
pathways that uh, go to Hora from Scala and from Hora to Kipi, but it's a great asset for, uh, for an island. It's a great asset and, and it's, it's history, it's archaeology, and we have to protect uh, these uh, finds and these paths and all, everything that has to do with antiquity. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, your second time back to Greece back in, in the 50s was when National Geographic uh, brought you back for some photography where you, 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 you got an opportunity to capture Sandorini and a couple of other islands. Um, let's talk a little bit about your background. So you were born in Chicago. Uh, you were born into a family that was in the media business, publishing business rather. Your father had the Daily Mirror, which was later on sold to his competitor, which was uh, the Daily News. And your brother as well was in the business. And so... Uh, you guys ended up coming to Greece, but you actually continued that uh, uh, path uh, and came back for more pictures. And that's what led you to stay on to Greece uh, and live on the island of Patmos as well. You have a beautiful home in Patmos from what uh, you've told me in the past. So tell us a little bit about your personal journey and connection. Well, <laughs> I, uh, my first job was uh, with the Associated Press in New York as a copy boy. Uh, doing errands, uh, Sam Blackman, the legendary uh, Sam Blackman was the uh, chief of the, the office at the time. Uh, but I did learn lessons about objectivity and reporting from the AP that have, have never uh, left me. I worked uh, one summer at the uh, Porchester Daily Item as a reporter, which was a tremendous experience working with a very uh, brilliant uh, reporter whose uh, family came from Albania. And uh, he had a, a unique mental capability of, uh, in his mind, recording verbatim conversations, which is a devastatingly potent uh, feature for a reporter to have. So I worked uh, also on the college newspaper, but, uh, then I, uh, you know, after uh, when I decided on a career, I spent time in the, uh, in the venture capital and investment banking business and had an incredible opportunity to work with some companies uh, like Thermo Electron, which was founded by the MIT professor, George Hatsopoulos. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, so I had this, uh, a wonderful uh, uh, time uh, with uh, young companies trying to help them uh, grow. But I always came back to Greece, I think in the last uh, 65 years, I don't know. I, uh, You're an honorary Greek and now a Greek citizen, right? I'm a Greek citizen now. Uh, and uh, very, very proud of it. I can call yes. the the Aegean Sea, my own now to some extent. I hope people wouldn't resent that as a Chicago born, uh, no, no. but uh, I, I'm very proud to call myself a citizen of uh, Greece. Robert, you're doing a great service for Greece. I'm sure I speak uh, for all Greeks when I say that you're promoting Greece, not only the uh, forgotten era of Greece, but you know, uh, you're showing images that have attracted people uh, throughout the world to travel through your kind of travelogue of photography. Um, and you have been able to also bring to life some areas that people are not aware of, such as Trumfades, um, so that is your third book, if I'm not mistaken, A Forgotten Era, A Vanished Era, Strumfades. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that little island that is very important, uh, especially during the Byzantine era because of the monastery? Well, there's a, a tiny little island, which in, until recently no one had ever heard of. Uh, and then... Uh, uh, as a result of our book uh, written with uh, Katerina Limperopoulou, uh, we brought some focus on the island. And now we're hoping uh, that uh, people will be inspired, the ministry, to uh, help restore the monastery there. 
the the island is unique in in many ways. Uh, one of the ways is not something you really want to be unique for, and that is it's in the middle of a very very uh, busy seismic zone, perhaps one of the most seismically active areas uh, in Europe, and it lies between uh, the island of Zakynthos and uh, Pilos in the Peloponnesus. And uh, it's really in the middle of nowhere and it's so tiny that it is never, you can't find it on, a, on Google Earth until you really uh, blow it up. Uh, but there it is. And um, it's uh, about one third the size of an airport runway. But the seismic activity has uh, been a feature of it for many years, but also it's a bird sanctuary and a ornithological interest uh, is very great because it's on a major flyway between Europe and Africa and migrating birds uh, stop there, which of course in the past until it was prohibited attracted a lot of hunters every year. Uh, but many species of birds uh, fly through there and others uh, nest there. So it's very important from that point of view. It has a, an amazing cedar forest. Uh, I was astounded the first time I walked through this dense, dense forest uh, in, on a Greek island, on a tiny little island. And you have, I have photographs of uh, cedar trees growing directly out of rocks. And the reason for that is that the limestone covering is over a clay base. And when it rains, the island retains water like a reservoir. It's porous on the top and imp impermeable, impermeable on the bottom. So the island is able to sustain agriculture and that's why the monastery was able to be housed there and have 50 or more monks at a time. Uh, the story of the monastery is very interesting. It was set up perhaps in the 11th, 12th century uh, by, the, uh, by a Byzantine princess who uh, they say was uh, saved there in a shipwreck. And uh, it uh, is the only Byzantine monastery set up by the emperor, by the emperor's family in the Ionian Sea. So from that standpoint, it's very important. Architecturally, it's quite unique because as far as I know, it's the only true fortified church in the Hellenic world that remains today. There are fortified churches in France and in Croatia and along the Dalmatian coast, but this one is a true fortified church with one entrance that uh, was, uh, you know, on the like on the third floor level with a staircase and probably a bridge that went to it. Uh, and uh, the reason it was fortified was because we know from a text, a long text about the island written in 1420 by Christopher Bondelmonde, that the island was continuously under attacks by pirates, Saracens, Turks, and uh, therefore to survive, they had to fortify uh, the uh, area where they lived, which was primarily in this uh, fortified church monastery combination. And um, even as late uh, as 1770, the uh, monks were all massacred in a Turkish raid. And there's a memorial on the island to the, the uh, monks who died and their uh, bones are preserved on the island. But until that time, uh, St. Dionysus, uh, the patron saint of Zakynthos, um had been uh, buried there at his request because he had been, uh, among other things in his career, he had been the abbot of the monastery in the Strophasis. And uh, as you know, uh, half the boys on, uh, on Zakynthos are named uh, Dionysi. 
It's, yes, uh, really this is a fascinating, topic. fascinating history that is uh, is actually not uh, promoted enough. I mean, this 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 actually should be a UNESCO heritage site, perhaps. It, it absolutely should be, and as a matter of fact, uh, I believe we're going to apply to the World Monuments Fund in just a few days now uh, for them to be put on the watch list. Of Congratulations. Because it's it's been badly damaged now by earthquakes, and it it can't be open to visitors now because it's unsafe. Oh, uh, I see. So, is it an endangered but, uh, island because of the seismic activity? Uh, that it, it's really the seismic activity and and uh, time uh, have uh, have brought the the monastery to a state where uh, uh, it's unsafe really to enter today. When, uh, when I was last there three years ago with Katarina and we were photographing the island, we were able to, uh, you know, photograph every uh, room basically in the monastery, but today you can't uh, go in. The, our book uh, celebrates the last monk of the Strophadas, who was an amazing man by the name of Father Gregory, who more than for 30 years, he kept this huge uh, facility going uh, and uh, would welcome the occasional visitor because it's not on any tour map or any, uh, right. any uh, shipping route. And uh, Katarina found the, uh, not only interviewed him uh, before he died, but also found the last lighthouse keeper on the island before they fully automated the lighthouse there. Uh, and they also, uh, she found the boatman who used to bring supplies to Father Gregory, who couldn't wow. uh, survive entirely on his own. So we, we tell the story in the, the book of all of uh, this, including, you know, uh, uh, St. Dionysus, He's now interred in Zakynthos, but he had wanted to be uh, buried in Strophadis, and maybe someday, who knows, maybe he'll there, go back there. Have they, have they found any uh, uh, ancient remains, uh, maybe a temple of some sort there, anything? Mm -hmm. not, not yet, but uh, uh, Stavros uh, Mamalukos, the architect, professor of architecture, at uh, Patras University has done an extensive study of the uh, monastery on the island and he's very uh, keen to see it uh, brought back to life. Uh, but he found interred in the, basically in the basement, an ancient church that was, oh. you know, completely the ruins of an ancient church that is hidden from view and hidden from access. Oh. And um, I, who knows, this spot could have been a holy spot from, from very ancient times. We just don't know at this point, but I am hoping that excavations will be conducted there. Uh, it may have been a site of pilgrimage and that may have been the basis right. for uh, having the uh, church and monastery there. That's fascinating, Robert. Uh, for all our viewers watching, you can uh, purchase uh, uh, Robert McCabe's wonderful books, the um, Sandorini Portrait of a Vanished Era, Strumfada's Portrait of a Vanished Era, and Greece, the Enchanted Land. You can find them all on Amazon. I urge everyone to check them out. They are really uh uh, just an uh, you know he captures an era that that will you know you, you can never see Greece like this again. Um, Robert, what are some of your favorite portraits, and what is a memory that you really remember uh, very very vividly that will always remain with you? Uh, I'll tell you a story of uh, this is a story about a Greek uh, two maybe two stories of Greek hospitality. Uh, in the early 60s, we were in Santorini. Uh, this was actually after the great earthquake of 1956, 
but the island had not recovered yet and hadn't been rebuilt. Uh, but there was a, a restaurant uh, called Lucas's Restaurant uh, in Fira, in Lower Fira. And uh, I was with a French couple and with the family doctor and my brother. And uh, for an entire week, we had uh, virtually all of our meals there. Someday we would take, go out with the picnic lunch. And uh, we would always ask for the bill and Lucas would say, he would say later, later, later. And uh, so on the last day we said, uh, Lucas, uh, you know, we're leaving on the boat in an hour. Uh, we want to settle a bill with you. He said, and this is were his exact words, souvenir, souvenir. Oh, oh I feel words, like, yeah, that's week, beautiful. For a week of food. And the, this poor man was trying to raise a family at the time. Uh, Lucas's restaurant still there. They have a hotel. Uh, wow, and, God bless uh, him. I'll never forget. Uh, God bless him is right. He's, of course, long since uh, left us. Yes. But, but that God act of hospitality. Soul. Can, can, can you imagine, no, no tourists, uh, you know, a poor man trying to run a restaurant on a Greek island and hear, you know, uh, five people uh, for uh, a week, uh, two or three meals a day, uh, that was, uh, would have been a big dent. Uh, we snuck into the kitchen and put... <laughs> So some of money under a plate there uh, for oh, him because we we really felt it was totally wrong to accept that kind of hospitality. Uh, the Good for you, we, Robert. Good for the, you. The, the boat the boat we took uh, that day went to Eos, which was our next stop, and uh, we uh, the the mayor of Eos gave his bedroom and his bed to the doctor we were traveling with. Doctors were so esteemed in the yes. Greek islands that this, and this New York doctor was a real character. Um, he, he, he slept, the, the mayor slept on his living room floor. Oh and my gave God. His own bed to the doctor. Have you ever heard of such a thing? Uh, so, uh, Beautiful these, these memories. Were, those are those are uh, really beautiful memories because that's the spirit of Greece. These are the people, the yeah. people, the soul and, is uh, the people and the history. It, it certainly is. And and on portraits, I, I actually, uh, it's hard for me. You put me on the spot of thinking of a, a portrait. I have, I have hundreds of uh, portraits in black and white and in color, and actually now I'm collecting them. I'm uh, very seriously thinking of doing a book called Portraits of the Greeks, one from the 1950s and another word, another one in color from 1957 to the, really to the present, because I have nice portraits from, uh, you know, from very recent uh, years and times. Robert, we um, were big fans. I'm a big fan. My favorite portrait is Sunio and the three sisters from Ipiros. I right. love your work. I hope everyone watching will get a chance to see, uh, you know, see what you've, you've done for Greece and how you've captured Greece through your beautiful lenses uh, throughout these six decades. Uh, we wish you the best and we'll, we'll keep following what you're doing. We'll wait for more to come from Robert McCabe, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your time. I know it's late in Greece and Athens Our big, all our love to Athens, Greece and we wish you nothing but the best, happiness and health. Thank you so much, Jana. Kalinikta. Kalinikta.